Good afternoon. This afternoon's session features John Taylor Williams, who henceforth, everyone knows him as Ike, but on book covers, he's John Taylor Williams, with Regina Marler, with a focus on Williams' most recent book, The Shores of Bohemia, a Cape Cod story, 1910 to 1960. Ike, who we are honored to have as a board member of the Charleston Literary Festival, has written a wonderfully engaging and lively account of the intellectual and artistic scene that blossomed in the beachfronts of Cape Cod in the first half of the 20th century. His voice is that of a keen observer of this scene, informed by firsthand experiences growing up on the Cape and having family connections with this world. To quote one reviewer, no more out of the way place ever exerted such a powerful influence on American art, literature, politics, and intellectual life as outer Cape Cod in the mid 20th century. The author shows with a brisk authority how and why, but most absorbingly who. He can sketch a whole life in a sentence. The resulting portrait is like a Bruegel painting, thick with personalities and incident. Ike Williams is an attorney specializing in intellectual property and First Amendment matters, and is the founder of a literary agency. His commitment to public service is deep and varied. For example, he has served as chair of the Boston Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and has held a number of prestigious positions in the art and literary worlds, including service as chair of the National Endowment for the Arts Awards Committee. Regina Marler has unique qualifications to help us understand this cultural scene that we're exploring today. Having written about the Beat Generation and the Bloomsbury Group, soulmates and part of the creative ferment that is at the heart of the shores of Bohemia. Regina has been a fixture at our festival since its founding, and we are delighted to welcome her back again in 2022. She's a prolific author, an insightful writer for the New York Review of Books and elsewhere. She has edited the selected letters of Vanessa Bell, and Queer Beats, How the Beats Turned America on the Sex. And her book, Bloomsbury Pie, The Making of the Bloomsbury Boom, is uh, also included in her repertoire. So much more relevant to us is that she's gonna be speaking with our friend Ike, who will be making brief remarks and then we'll have a conversation between the two of them. So the format of the session is as normal. We'll leave 10 to 15 minutes for question at the end of the session. And finally, I'd like to remind everybody to turn off your phones and, or silence them. And I want to thank Lee and John McNary, who are in the front row, for sponsoring this. We couldn't do this without the sponsors, and I know I see a number of you in the room, and you make it possible to hold this festival. So thank you very much. Ike? Uh, Walter, <coughs> before you leave, I want to thank you on behalf of of the board, which I've gotten to know and love, uh, our staff, uh, our donors, and the wonderful people who make this festival work. And I've always thought of uh, Walter as the, um, the person who, um, remember Danny Kay, the Connecticut Yankee? The Connecticut Yankee. I'm old enough to in, remember in, that. <laughs> The Connecticut Yankee in uh, Charleston's court. And what he's done in this court is really exceptional. The leadership that he's brought to this board, the professionalism that he's helped the staff gain, the, <coughs> the, uh, the success of this festival. And much of it is because of, I've never seen it worth it uh, like Walter's, but it's the twinkle in his eye. It's his, um, his sense that we can build something better and better each year. Uh, that's made this very special. And uh, I, I think on, on behalf of us, we say, well done you. Uh, I'll leave the podium. I, I obviously, this would not be possible without the board of directors here. And I also have to thank the staff. I was gonna do that on Sunday when I'm doing a presentation or an introduction on Sunday, but we've got the best staff in the world. And, I think I was lucky in inheriting them or grooming them, but they are just wonderful. So that's the reason it works. I'm glad to take the credit, but I don't deserve it. You Thank deserve you. It. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I guess we're gonna miss the storm for a little while anyway. Uh, before Regina and I um, 
get into a conversation. And of course, as you've already heard, I mean, she's been part of a kind of a parallel um, group of kind of utopian uh, creative people with radical beliefs and social change uh, in the Bloomsbury group, um, to which, as you remember, we first started out connected with as we started the festival. Uh, this group that we're going to talk about is a little different um, because I think when it's a broader group of Americans who participate in it, uh, and it has a broader span of geography and time, we, we really start the books, it, it's five decades from 1910 to 1960 uh, in this movement uh, to hopefully transform America. And of course, we've heard some wonderful uh, transformative talks, Eddie's talk, uh, the talk about American women. Uh, so in a sense, it's part of the theme that we've seemed to have developed a little for this year's festival in the attempts of so many people to make America meet the promise that it has. And that's what drove these people. Uh, they start in Greenwich Village in New York in 1910. Restless young Americans from all over the country are coming into Greenwich Village because it's the center of radical politics. It's the center of social welfare movements. Uh, remember, the largest group of immigrants in America is centered in Greenwich Village. So the tenements and all of these immigrants, none of whom speak English as a rule, are now being integrated into the, what turned out to have been one of the great public school systems of that period in New York. Uh, so it's drawing all kinds of people who are interested in transformative change and the arts, because it is the center of American culture. And it's a, it's a strange time in America. This is the height of the post-Civil War kind of oligarchies, <laughs> you know, with huge steel mills, huge mining, huge textile mills, all owned by single families, as a rule. Uh, enormous amount of employees. There have never been groups of employees this large in American history. Terribly housed, six-hour days, women and children. Um, and if you're injured on the job, that's it. So there's a beginning of the union movement, the Cigar Workers Union, the International Women's Garment Union, uh, and the beginning of the International Workers of the World, the so-called Wobblies, are beginning to organize <coughs> in all these industries. So it's a very tumultuous and fascinating period. And it's the beginning of radical journalism. The muckrakers are all based in New York. Lincoln Steffens, who rooms with John Reed in New York. Um, and in the midst of this group is a woman named Mary Heaton Vorse, who has already bought a house in Provincetown at the edge of the Cape. Here's Boston, and there's Provincetown. And there's a ferry that takes two hours to get there from Boston. That's about the only way to get there. She also has a house in New York. She's deeply involved in the labor movement in New York and the and reform. She begins to invite all of these people that we are going to meet in our conversation to come to Provincetown in the summer because the whaling industry has failed. The cod have moved north to the Grand Banks and their houses are empty uh, and it's been deforested and so there's no agriculture. So people are leaving the Cape in droves. So it's, it's almost as Thoreau saw it in his journals. I mean, it has not changed. It's beautiful, but it's, there's no way to make a living except by the sea. So she's able to house these people, um, and they begin to come there every summer. Floyd Dell, who's the editor of The Masses, which is the radical magazine they all contribute to, um, begins to call Provincetown, Greenwich Village, sunburned. Um, and that's, that's the beginning of people spending almost half their life in these three towns in the Cape, Provincetown, Truro, and Wellfleet, and Greenwich Village, this back and forth. Uh, and this group of people, for two generations, lived through two wars, the Depression, Prohibition. Prohibition is a very important thing for them because nobody starts drinking as heavily as they do during Prohibition. Actually, America never drank as much as they did during Prohibition. They've never drank that much again. Uh, so. That's sort of the stage, these two geographic places, this group of people 
restless young women seeking to be the new woman, you know, having the same sexual rights as men, same right to employment, uh, same right not to have a child. Margaret Sanger's in the middle of this. Um, so they're moving back and forth between these two, creating some of our great cultural works and some of our highest, probably radical moments uh, in labor organization. So uh, that's sort of the stage, and now let's get into it. <laughs> um, there are two strains that you can see right away in the people who are beginning to, to settle and to, to you know, divide their lives in this way. And one is a kind of an aristocratic strain, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot of um, industrial fortunes and mm -hmm. the, the children and grandchildren right. of, of, of those, of those um, well, you know, the robber baron era. Um, and, and then there are the artists. And, and you can't have an artist colony if no one can afford to be there. So obviously, the, uh, there, were, there were shacks you could rent. It was very cheap to live there. There was um, no plumbing. No plumbing, no, no electrical. Plumbing. No heating, no electric. Yeah. So you have these two things coming, coming together. I, I think that's. That's the story of the French Revolution. It wasn't, it wasn't started by the lower classes. Neither was the Russian Revolution. Mm -hmm. And Mao was hardly a peasant. Um, I think most radical movements are a combination of well-educated people and then people who were drawn by passion to the movement. Remember, a lot of these people who joined this radical movement of unionization and the rights of individuals these people are very involved in civil rights. These are the people who found the NACP, for instance. Um, um, many of them are coming from Europe, mm. where mm -hmm. you know, this is anarchism and labor unions are part of their lives, even though they're not highly educated. That working class has been radicalized. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's I remember Marx always believed it would be Germany that would start the revolution because uh, it was so unionized. Absolutely. Mm. So we have we have a uh, an interesting combination of of people, different different um, uh, political strains, almost all on the left. And uh, we were talking yesterday about how a lot of their radical positions have become mainstream now, obviously, the you know, civil rights movement. Uh, many aspects of the labor movement, if not, you know, not all of them, but many aspects of well, the Well, the right to organize and the, and, and the right to seek under law better conditions. Absolutely. Right? The vote for women, yeah. which was a really big part of uh, the you know, These were meant most of the, this heterodoxy club in New York, which all, all these women belong to. Um, Helen Gurley Flynn, who leads the big textile strikes, the Bread and Roses strike. Um, Emma Goldman, who, who you know, starts as a young uh, immigrant in the rag trade in New York in the International Ladies' Garment Union. I mean, all of these, these, these people are you know, combining and finding common ground. And even the aristocratic, you mentioned, mainly turn out to be children of, of um, professors and things, not of Robert Barons. I don't see any Fricks or Mellons or joining this movement. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that the, uh, one of the uh, passages I, I knew you weren't crazy about reading from the book, but I wanted everybody to enjoy this um, as much as I did. And there's so many names. Um, an incredible number of people in your book, artists, architects, um, politicians, organizers, um, and of course, uh, some of the bigger names, like Eugene O'Neill, who's associated with Provincetown Players. Um, and so uh, one of the, the first play that he did with them, um, Bound East for Cardiff, was performed on July 28, 1916. And Susan Glaspell, the playwright, later described that memorable night. The sea had been good to Eugene O'Neill. It was there for his opening. There was a fog, just as the script demanded, fog bell in the harbor. The tide was in, and it washed under us and around, spraying through the holes in the floor, giving us the rhythm and the flavor of the sea, 
while the big dying sailor talked to his friend, Driss, of the life he had always wanted, deep in the land where you'd never see a ship or smell the sea. The cast of that first O'Neill performance is not completely known. O'Neill directed it and played the second mate who had but one line. The dying sailor, Yank, was played by Jig Cook and his two companions by the experienced actors Teddy Ballantyne and Frederick Burt. Jack Reed and Wilbur Daniel Steele played minor roles. The sets were simple because O'Neill had overruled Bill and Marguerite Zorak's plans for a modernist cubist backdrop. The audience that opening night included the rising journalist Louise Bryant with her large violet eyes, soft black hair and high color, and a red cape over a white linen dress. Her play, The Game, was on the same bill with O'Neill's. And rumors were already circulating that while she was living with Reed, she was also seeing O'Neill and still not divorced from her husband. <laughs> there are a lot of sentences like that in the book. Charles Demuth was dressed in a black shirt and purple cummerbund, and his companion Marsden Hartley in a long blue coat with a gardenia in its buttonhole. The grieving Mary Vorse O'Brien, who had recently lost her husband Joe, had begun an affair with her neighbor, the architect and set designer Don Corley. John Reed was also in a dark place, having lost his Harvard comrade, the poet Alan Seeger, in combat at the Western Front, while Reed was covering the Mexican Revolution. The seats would be filled night after night that summer by a combined crowd of artists and tourists who flooded the town. In that last year of peace, the artists' ball at the town hall drew 800 artists and art students in full costume. Mabel Dodge moped in her newly refurbished guest coast, guest coast Guard boathouse on the race point dunes, slowly losing hope of ever luring Reed back and angry with Mary Vorse for having stolen her Greenwich Village friends from her circle. As Susan Glaspell recalled in her book, The Road to the Temple, it was a great summer. We swam from the wharf as well as rehearsed there. We could lie on the beach and talk about plays, everyone writing or acting or producing. Life was all of a piece, work not separated from play. All for a moment forgot their personal lives, entranced by the sound of the waves, the fog horn, and the thrill of being present at the birth of a new American theater. So tell me something about this, the power of, of groups. Of course, this moves over 50 years, so groups come and go into the scene. But there is something synergistic, isn't it? People coming together and sharing their ideas. that They're making something that wouldn't they wouldn't have done on their own. They just seem to have found so much in common. That, that was incredible. This first group of people, now we're talking people who started coming in 1910 and through the First World War uh, and then returned pretty damaged, many of them, uh, after the First World War. So the, the, and right up to sort of the uh, 1929. So that's, that's one generation. And then there's the generation that follows them. Mm -hmm. which is um, much more involved with the Bauhaus immigrants and uh, Hans Hoffmann's school of painting that begins abstract expressionism in America. But that, that, that's a different group of people. Uh, they had things in common. Um, they didn't believe in religion, um, which freed them uh, in, a, in a way to be much more creative. Uh, it also freed them from parents' responsibility. These, these people were terrible parents, believe me. Uh, uh, and the kids grew up at cocktail parties, basically, for all of these kids. But uh, many of them turned out fine. But it was, they, uh, so I think this particular generation, it was the new woman that bound them. Because when we get into the second group, we have Mary McCarthy and all kinds of women who feel pretty confident about who they are. Um, but here, they, they, these are role models for almost all the young American women who, are, who, who want to be the American woman. These uh, people like Emma Goldman and uh, Susan Glaspell. And, um, and so, and the, the new woman wants to lead a life like a man. She wants to have a career. She wants to decide whether she has children or not. And, and, and she wants to be free to divorce or have an affair if they're going to do so. Um, so, um, 
that binds them up because these men agree to that. I mean, they say, oh, that's part of the deal. Uh, and that is, I think, because this is the most irreligious group that I've sort of studied in America, um, who still didn't scorn religion. They just didn't see it. Remember, they're breaking out of the Victorian era. They saw it as, as really repressing people's rights. Um, so, uh, you know, they went to church to get married, and they, and they went to church to get buried, but that's it. Uh, and while America was deeply anti-Semitic during this period, you know, all kinds of uh, laws being passed to try to limit Jewish immigration, because the, the, the big pogroms were going on in Poland uh, and, and sections of, uh, of Russia, Tsarist Russia at that point, we were getting you know, several million Jewish immigrants in just a few years. So uh, they didn't, that didn't mean anything to them. Um, so uh, there are enormous amounts of inter intermarriages. Uh, there isn't, there still isn't, an interesting in the lower cave, there isn't a temple until you reach Hyannis, um, which is a long drive. I mean, they, they just, that was one thing that bound them up. The other thing was this Athenian idea of a public that just what, actually what we're having, where everybody comes together respectfully and talks about controversial things. And that doesn't mean you don't leave this room saying, I don't agree with a word that goddamn guy said. But they, they were, it was all about modeling themselves on ancient Athens where people discussed every issue, whether it was sex or politics or art, uh, in public. Um, and whether it was in the, the magazines they started, the masses, the New Republic, the nation, uh, all kinds of debates always. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there was no cocktail party in which people didn't take sides and argue different things. And I think that bound them up. This, this freedom that it didn't make any difference where you came from is, uh, as one of the poets once said, it's what you got. I mean, th these were elitists in that sense. I mean, you were not going to be in this group if you didn't do something pretty impressive, whether it was a painting, a poet, you know, a writer, John Despassos, Edmund Wilson, Tennessee Williams, Norman Mailer. I mean, th this was an elite group of people. All of them created something, and all of them didn't sit back. And I mean, they took front rows in politics. So I think that all bound them up, that idea that we all have a right to participate in debating what's right for America. We all have sort of equality as men and women, and um, we all have a dedication to a, a new culture in America, a, a new kind of play. Where we started, I mean, this play of Eugene O'Neill's is, you know, breaks new ground because all the plays are based on the upper classes before this, before O'Neill. Um, anyway, so I think that was that bound mm -hmm. those people up, plus booze. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I was going to say, we, we, there, is, there are a fair number of parallels with Bloomsbury, although Bloomsbury is a little bit earlier. But um, they're, obviously they um, were irreligious, pretty much. Um, uh, Bloomsbury also, which is, if you don't know, it's the circle around Virginia Woolf. Um, so they didn't have religion. They didn't care much about their parents no. and uh, their parents' strictures. And they were actively fighting against Victorian values they'd been raised with. Um, and also sometime early on, they kind of imbibed a little bit of the, the free love spirit that was going around. They decided we're going to do it differently. We're going to um, live differently domestically. Maybe, maybe men and women can share a house. Maybe that's okay, you know, artists working, working together in the same house. Um, maybe, uh, maybe we can be, uh, we can have affairs with the same sex, you know, and they weren't out publicly, but privately they were doing exactly what they wanted to be doing. And, um, and also, it made it possible for women to be artists and writers, too, because when you make domestic innovations, when you, which you see a lot of mm -hmm. in these homes as well, um, you have a life in which a, a woman isn't committed to being a hostess and, and so forth. And there are some complaints on those grounds <laughs> among the women you cover. But yeah. it's a kind of an interesting thing. What we don't have, though, is, is all that booze. You could wring this book out over a glass with ice. Yeah. And, <laughs> and this is before prohibition. <laughs> I mean, after yeah. prohibition, the second generation is even heavier drinking. Um, so it's uh, a muse. To, you know, it opens things. Yeah. And, 
they really did view it as a muse. I mean, almost everyone drank heavily, and they actually believed it contributed to the creative process. I mean, when we get into the painters, um, uh, I mean, they drank incredibly heavily in their studios at night, uh, and yet, I mean, these are the works that sell for millions of dollars, the de Koenigs, the yeah. Rothkos. Um, and the writers, I mean, Mailer, and these, even the earlier writers in this period, I mean, we were talking the other day, I mean, they had this thing about writer's block, and writer's block occurs because uh, somebody convinces them, maybe their agent as a writer, that you just got to get off the booze because this, this last piece was just dreadful. Because they have a Remington typewriter on the table, depending on whether they're left or right-handed, they have an ashtray, a package of Lucky Strikes, which costs a nickel, and, and a bottle of, you know, old something or other, <laughs> um, which probably costs three dollars, and a glass, and dunk, 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 you throw the carriage back and you take a drink. Then dunk, 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 throw the carriage back and you take smoke. And that rhythm was so instilled in the creative process that all of these guys and gals um, said, oh my God, I, I just can't do it anymore. I've, I only can, I can only do the typing if I'm, and, and so it, it, it created an enormous group of alcoholics. Um, I mean, Edmund Wilson uh, was a terrible alcoholic and, and um, he got up early and, and worked for six hours without any, but after that. This is the incredible it was all thing, over. really. You know, um, because most people, if you yeah. drink like that, you're ruined by it. Yeah. And a lot of these people, their work ethic was Well, we incredible. have The Lost Weekend in the book. Yes, you know. that's right, The Lost Weekend. Uh, because it takes place there. If it, you've ever read it, it's the greatest story there is about a drunk. And it's played by Ray, Ray Milland in the movies, but um, at, uh, some people, O'Neill's really interesting because he's a binge drinker all his life until he marries Carlotta and moves to California. And that's, he doesn't really create anything. So great after that, almost everything's done on the Cape. <laughs> but he only does it sober. Is it the Cape or is it the booze? But he'll only do it sober. He said, everything I tried to write if I was drinking is awful. So I decided I'm never going to drink while I'm writing. So he was a special case. But that kind of discipline was hard to come by. Yeah. Particularly when everybody else was drinking. And remember, everybody had a still in their house. Um, but my favorite was in, in the, this a uh, house that John Dos Passos and his wife lived in it, and the still was called The Boy. And The Boy consisted of a sort of a huge vat with pure alcohol in it, and people would throw lemon peel and orange peel in it. And um, they had these incredible parties, and, uh, and a doctor attended it, uh, and he said, I recommend it to everybody. <laughs> and, I mean, they just, it was just. Uh, Camel cigarettes, they're good was, for you. Yeah. And yet, and yet, as, uh, mm -hmm. um, they just turned out some incredible stuff. But it's a factor too in in the lives of the the second and third generation, the children who you say were raised to those cocktail parties. So you get to witness this incredible creativity, um, but you also get neglected for long periods, and um, sometimes abandoned, and you're kind of left to run around. It's a um, it's a difficult. Difficult upbringing. I, I think, oddly enough, that sort of ended in 1960, and I don't know why. I mean, there'll always be alcoholic creators, mm -hmm. but the idea that creativity is, is as closely linked with alcohol mm -hmm. as it was from 1910 to 1960, mm -hmm. I've never seen a period like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, it was so easily available because it was just being, Cape Cod was the center of the booze trade during Prohibition. So all these fishermen would go out three miles and everybody would joke, you'd see the guy rowing an empty boat back, but he was having a hell of a time. And it, of course, it turned out that underneath the boat, he had a huge net full of bottles that he picked up from a Canadian rum runner. And so, I mean, it was just, and, and these boats would come down and Provincetown was a rowdy town. I mean, it was a naval base in both wars because of the German submarines were patrolling that area of the Atlantic because there was so much shipping coming down from the coasts of, from Maine all the way down through Boston. 
And uh, <coughs> so sailors and booze, you know, that's what I think a made Provincetown the gay capital of, uh, of the United States during that mm -hmm. period because uh, that's what attracts Paul Cadmus, the painter, and that's mm -hmm. what attracts uh, Tennessee Williams, and that's mm -hmm. what attracted a whole, you know, just a ton of people because it was, well, port cities are always the most tolerant in America. I mean, Kansas City compared to San Francisco. <laughs> well, you know that if you're gay or anything else, Kansas City ain't going to be as much fun as San Francisco, you know. And that was very true of Provincetown. And even the Portuguese who had been recruited into the whaling industry, so the town was kind of ethnically divided. All, all the sort of um, Protestants were along the street where Mary Heaton Vorse and everybody else tended to live. And then the West End was all Portuguese. It was the biggest Portuguese-speaking section other than Brazil in the New World. And they'd been there since the 1700s. Um, and they were deeply Catholic. But they also viewed the, this new influx of gays. We talked, yeah. you, the scene you set, you mm -hmm. know, Mar Marston Hartley yeah. uh, Demeth. and Charles Demeth, both mm -hmm. gay, very outwardly gay. Uh, and it was okay for promise town. I mean, you ain't going to marry my daughter, you know. <laughs> but, they were the ones that first rented their houses and started all of the famous nightclubs were all owned by Portuguese Catholics, which attracted everybody, you know, from you know, just well, Louise knew, Bourgeois. You yeah, know. They, they knew where the money was, mm. you know. It was, it's always been in, you know, the bars, the nightlife, yeah. and bringing in, and, and, you know, obviously Tennessee Williams is, a, you know, another example yeah. of somebody who's, yeah. So you have a really long association with Cape Cod, and I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to hear about it. No, I don't. Um, it's funny, I, I come from a different world. I, I don't. <laughs> I'm not, Set that up, we're, and we're then gonna, uh, shut down. <laughs> um, I had only been over the bridge to Cape Cod. You know, the Cape Cod Canal was dug, so the United Fruit Company, which was started in Provincetown, uh, could take its fruit around to New York yeah. and Boston. Um, so I'd only been over once for one night to go to a club dancing with a couple of friends. Um, so I didn't, it was dark. I, I, I don't even know what it looked like. And then I, I fall in love with a, a woman in New York and, um, and she's, we're at the point where she says, you know, meet the family. Uh, so I said, oh, gulp, okay. Um, so we, we drive um, and this is 1967 and I, I meet her, her four-time married father, who's a figure in this book, who, who's a famous designer and architect, um, and, uh, and a painter, uh, and pretty far to the left. And I, I've grown up in a pretty white suburb uh, with conservative parents. Uh, I voted for Richard Nixon the year I graduated from Harvard. Uh, and so this is 1967, I, I'm no longer going to vote for Richard Nixon, but I still haven't experienced anything like this. Uh, and so that, that's when I entered the fray. Now, it turns out that I knew a lot of the children of these people. Uh, Dwight McDonald's son was a classmate of mine, and um, a lot of the architect's sons, uh, Serge Shemayev's two sons, uh, Charles Jenks, the creator of postmodernist theory architecture, was my best friend and a year behind me. Um, Rule Wilson, Edmund Wilson, and Mary McCarthy's son was, so I knew them, but I didn't know anything about their world. I mean, I just knew them as Harvard students. So it, it, it was a total shock to me. I said, whoa, whoa. <laughs> but I like to drink, so I thought, well, I can fit in, you know? <laughs> uh, but what fascinated me was all this creativity and all this really belief that America could be something better. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and everybody was on civil rights marches, and uh, you know, my, my father-in-law had been beaten and jailed with King and Selma, and, you know. Um, and so it was a whole new kind of world, and I got fascinated by it, and I started making notes about conversations, and then, you know, find somebody else who told me a different story, and I began to make notes, and then I thought, well, there's never been a group biography of these people. I mean, they're great biographies of Hopper, or. Uh, Hoffman or Rothko or uh, mm -hmm. writers, you know, Dos Passos, Wilson, Tennessee Williams. Um, 
but there's not a group biography of them. Mm -hmm. And I began to think about it, but I had two jobs and three boys. So I'd work, I'd work on it in the summer. So it took me 12 years. <laughs> and, and part of it was for my wife who died during that period. And um, anyway, so I, I didn't set out to write a book, but I, I, I did. You know, when you see something vanishing that you really are interested in, like a landscape or your, your children's childhood, I mean, you sort of want to mem memorialize it because it'll never be there again, you know, and that's yeah. the way I felt. It's, it, that's why I wrote Bloomsbury Pie. Right. Because I had, I had edited Vanessa's letters. Right. And I met that generation that was, that was you know, aging and, and leaving yeah. us. Yes. And, and before they went, I thought, oh, I've got to talk to them about this. Right. I've got to get this story. I've got to. So it was a way of staying in that world. Yeah. And so you went in and, 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 and deeper. It's kind of an interesting book. It covers you know, 50 years, give or take. Um, but it's not just you know, trotting through chronologically. You, you stop and you deal with the thematic issues. I mean, I think that the, the struggles um, on the left between you know, the, uh, uh, everybody very well-meaning, but you have the, you know, the followers, it, those who thought that Stalin was you know, absolutely right in his reforms and, and the Trotskyites and the whole that battle and then the socialists and then people who are just sort of left-leaning moderates. You have the whole, the whole gamut there. And then at different you again, with Gropius and, and, um, uh, and also with Hans Hoffman. It's cool coming through. You, you spread out there, and you, you talk about the amazing appeal of the art schools oh. that were in, in Provincetown and um, in the surrounding area, and the, the figures who came in for that. Mm. So. Well, I mean, they were, they, you'd think they were isolated, but remember, they're going back and forth to New York, often for the winter or for major labor movement things, or for their plays being performed or their book being published or their play being put on or whatever. So they're very worldly, but they're, I mean, and they, and they spend increasing time there, not just the summers. But they're, like everybody, they were deeply affected by um, the 1913 Armory Show, the first time anybody in America had seen, you know, Impressionists moving on into Cubism, and, mm -hmm. and the, I mean, nobody had seen those, even the major painters, ex unless you had money and could go to France. So, I mean, they were the, the painters were transformed by that, uh, and then the labor movement, the Bread and Roses strike, the huge mining strikes out in the Rockefeller copper mines and stuff. Uh, so, and the violence of it. I mean, the fact that the the state would shoot women and children, you know. Um, so. That was a huge, un, you know, tumultuous period, and then there, and then the First World War, um, in which a, almost all of them serve in one capacity or another. A lot of them volunteer early. I mean, half the ambulance corps before we have a, our own ambulance corps, we haven't entered the war yet. It's, these are private ambulance corps. This one happens to be the Morgan R has uh, J P Morgan's. He he bought a lot of ambulances and trainers, and they were attached to the French army. We hadn't entered the First War yet. And that's where Hemingway is, and Despasos, and all these people who are in the book are, are working, you know, carrying dead bodies and gas men, and people, you know, spitting out their intestines. I mean, for, these are kids who are, you know, 19, 20 years old. I mean, these were really, uh, well, we can see from Hemingway the experiences he had, but, um, and a lot of them are in combat. Um, so that, that, that's, that's a transformative thing. And then... Um, during, the, during the war, too. Yeah, the, uh, and then the, the, World the, war. the Depression. Yeah. I mean, these people weren't interested in capitalism. They were interested in accumulating money. Yeah. But it, there was, I mean, who was buying a painting? Uh, who, who could afford a theater ticket? You might afford a movie ticket. But, I mean, this was a terrible time. And if Roosevelt hadn't started these arts programs, which were started by people in this book, mm -hmm. um, they probably, these artists wouldn't have survived. Um, so, and then obviously prohibition and booze we've talked about. And then in, in the First World War, uh, there's a huge, they're progressives. They had followed Teddy Roosevelt as what was called a square deal. 
and his cousin, of course, rips it off and calls it the New Deal. But um, the square deal for Teddy was that labor and management had to sit down and talk to each other about working conditions and wages formally. You know, they couldn't just stiff the workers. Um, so, and then they moved to socialism because Wilson says we're not going into the First World War. And progressives, and when I say progressives, I mean French, English, German. The progressive movement was a pacifist movement. They did not believe in war, um, and so. Wilson flips on them and goes into the war, and then they move further to the left in 1919. The Communist Party of the United States is founded. Um, interesting enough, two of the founders are the American Civil Liberties Union and the NAACP. I mean, they, they mean there isn't any Stalin then, uh, and it's the, it's the heyday of the beginning of Lenin's uh, taking power, so there's the, the great Russian theater movement, there's the constructivist painter. It looks pretty great. It looked great, yeah. <laughs> From a distance. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, and so they really affect, uh, and the Spanish Civil War, I mean, a lot of them, particularly Jews, because here they're watching, Hitler's taken power in 33, and Kristallnacht has happened, and nobody's doing a goddamn thing. Uh, and now they, they Everybody knows their camps being established. They don't know much about them. But you know, all the Jews' property is being taken. If you're lucky enough to escape, you'll survive. And if you're not, you won't. And, and so this is their chance to fight Hitler. Because Hitler's the only, Germany is the only country backing Franco Spain. Uh, and so Stalin is backing the new republic, and so it's the two isms going at it. And, um, Absolutely. And, and, so and then the art, the art exiles. We've got uh, Max Ernst, yeah. um, who marries Peggy Guggenheim to, right. to get out of Europe. Um, and he had been in prison, so he knew what he, knew what he was facing. Um, and Leonora Carrington followed. Uh, so we have surrealists coming in, and then we have um, the, the rise of abstract expressionism, which is, you know, an incredible movement in the beginning of the New York School, and it's, you know, split well, that, between New York. That is an odd thing, isn't it, that we would get both Hans Hoffmann, who had a very uh, successful school in Bavaria um, after the First World War, uh, and in 1932 he's invited to teach at UC Berkeley, so he goes over, uh, and in, and while he's there, Hitler's legally elected as chancellor. And his wife, they're both Jewish, his wife telegraphs him, say, don't come back. Uh, and it takes her six more years to get out. But so he starts teaching in New York, and then he opens the school in Provincetown. Uh, but he'd given a couple of lectures in New York about color and, um, and gestural painting, uh, in other words, not it's, you don't have to do anything that people recognize. It's all about this gestural self-expression. And all of these people who are sitting in the audience are just bowled over, de Koenig and, and Gorky. And, all these people. Yeah. Um, and so they follow him to Provincetown. And it's every, every single person that I can see, and the two great critics mm -hmm. that become the critics, and the two great gallerists who show this work. Because <clears throat> when it starts, there's no standards for abstract painting. I mean, how can you tell an abstract painting that's good or bad? I mean, you, you know, people were <laughs> amazed. You know, what the hell is that? Uh, and there were no galleries that showed it, and there were no critics who told you whether it was good or bad, and you knew no one who had it in their collection. So it, it, it could have died so easily, except for Hans and the people he influenced, the two great critics, Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg, uh, and then there's two women who started the galleries, Peggy Guggenheim, who we've mentioned, and Betty and Parsons, Parsons yeah. uh, who are willing to show the, these, you know, uh, spatter paintings uh, by Jackson Pollock. Nobody had heard of Jackson Pollock, and what the hell was that, you know? Uh, and, and out of it became probably the greatest movement created in America in art. I mean, it influenced the entire art world, even the Europeans have to call it the New York School. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, and that's all in Provincetown. And that is just about it. We have to yeah. do some questions now. I, I hope we have some. If you have a question, I'd love it if you could stand and a micro, uh, microphone will be brought to you. 
Okay. About how the people got there. Were there personal invitations, or did they say, oh, I'm just going to go rent a house and hang out? What were the mechanics of people actually going there and being there together? Did Would you hear you it? repeat that, because I didn't get it clearly. What were the mechanics? Did, pe did people tend to go and, and, and buy a place? Did they rent a place? Did they come briefly in a for an Airbnb, what, what was yeah, it? Yeah, well, as we, as we were saying, most of the people were poor that she invited, and so they rented. And you could rent a place for $3 a week, uh, a house. Um, again, no utilities at all. Um, and uh, many of them had been fish houses and scaling houses and sheds for equipment. And if you had a little more money, um, you c could rent a, a house on the street, everybody was renting, particularly in the other two towns we haven't talked about so much, because as province became a great tourist center, starting sort of after the First World War, uh, a lot of people move to these adjacent towns. Now, for instance, Wellfleet, all of the Bauhaus movement that fled with Gropius uh, after Hitler's election end up in Truro, uh, and not in Provincetown. And, uh, and, so they built houses, but the land was incredibly cheap, and you could build a house. When the Bauhaus started building their houses there, uh, uh, probably fifteen thousand dollars for the land and, and a full house, designed, you know, the, the house you designed. So it remained very cheap because there was no, there were no jobs down there, so people were continually fleeing, particularly during the depression. So it, it, almost anybody who had cash could find something to rent. And as after the, after the Second World War, of course, there's a lot of money in America. So people, now people, artists and writers begin to buy. I mean, Norman Mailer buys a house, you know, that, that kind of thing. But uh, Edmund Wilson doesn't buy a house until 1941, I think. I mean, they didn't have enough money to buy land in a house, but almost everybody had money to rent. Mm -hmm. And they were converting ice houses and other things oh, like that. Yeah. There were little little shacks all over. Right in the center here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Early on, you mentioned John Reed. Um, can you talk a little bit about what part he played? It's a major, major figure in your book. We only touched on it briefly. John Reed. So John Reed uh, is born in Portland, Oregon. He's the son of a fairly wealthy lumber merchant. Um, he has a brother who actually serves in the First World War, much, to, and John doesn't, much to his mother's disappointment. Um, his father wants him to go to Harvard, and he obliges. Uh, and at Harvard, he just meets all these, his class is just filled with interesting people, um, poets and writers that will become really well known. Uh, and. He is, he's, he's uh, in the Glee Club. He's, um, he's a, uh, what do you call it? People, a cheerleader on the football team. I think he's on the swimming team. Um, in those days, of course, being a cheerleader for, for a male was not what it might be today. But um, he was really involved in Harvard. But he was very interested in sort of romantic literature, and his professor said, you ought to spend some time in Europe. And um, he, he went to Europe, but then he got, the Mexican uh, War came about, uh, and he went down uh, on the border um, to follow the American back and forth across the border in Arizona, Mexico, in that strange border war. Um, and that begins his life as a reporter and an interest in revolutions. Uh, and he comes back to Greenwich Village and he ends up rooming with Lincoln Steffens, who's old enough to be his dad, but is his hero, because Steffens' wife has just died. And Steffens is the leader of the muckrakers who are opposing corruption in government and in huge businesses, um, you know, the meat industry and, and the oil industry, the, all these. Uh, and he's deeply influenced. Um, and then he gets involved, 
increasingly in the masses. He becomes a major contributor in the Masses magazine. Uh, he's deeply admired by everybody. I mean, he's just one of those people that everybody loves. Women love him, men love him. What brings him to Cape Cod? Well, so he, he, his first love affair is with um, Mabel Dodge, who's much older than he is. She's everywhere, yeah. Mabel Dodge. Uh, and, um, sh and they get involved in the big uh, silk workers' strike in New Jersey, all the Italian silk workers' strike. And they're beaten horribly, and they, so they have a big pageant in New Madison Square Garden, which they organize with all kinds of um, theatricals. It's, I think 50,000 people come into the, um, and they, they're co-planning it. She has this huge salon in New York with all these radicals and artists and things. And so she goes, takes him to Europe for a couple of years. And then she brings him to Provincetown the first time. Um, now he's on tour with his book about the Mexican Revolution. And he's giving a lecture out on the West Coast. And this very beautiful young woman comes up afterwards and um, Basically, we're talking rock and roll groupie here. Uh, and they end up, and it's Louise Bryant. And she's married to a dentist, uh, but she's only about 23, I think. And she had gone to the University of Utah, I think, uh, where she'd already become quite radical and interested in the labor movement and stuff. Um, and he brings her east. Uh, so th next time, poor Mabel finds that she's built a big silken tent and rented a big house for she and John, but John's living in town with Louise, and we, you read a little about oh, that. And, um, that must have so, and then, <clears throat> But John becomes even <clears throat> more radicalized, mainly in that <clears throat> when he sees all these peaceful um, Italian silk workers being beaten by cavalry police officers, I mean, just brutally beaten. Uh, he's arrested too, and that's the turning point. After that, he becomes increasingly, increasingly radical. Still charming, um, still a womanizer. I mean, ultimately, she breaks off with O'Neill, and they marry. <coughs> um, they both cover the Russian Revolution together. <coughs> he, he has split off from the Communist Party of the United States has formed a splinter Communist Party, even more radical about the rights of workers. Uh, therefore, oddly enough, Lenin, not sure whether he's straight or not, that if he'd been a member of the American Communist Party, which had been reported sort of directly to Moscow in some ways. So, he's so while he's in Moscow, Lenin has him sent south to cover some, I think, bogus activity, and it's filled with an infectious disease sweeping through this area of southern Russia. And he comes back to Moscow deeply sick. He's already lost a kidney, as you. Uh, and uh, Louise comes, and he dies within a couple of weeks. And, but Lenin, to hedge his bets, makes him the first American ever buried in the Kremlin. And the only other one was his friend, Big Bill Haywood, the leader of the IWW, who was also buried in the Kremlin. Um, so we have two American labor leaders buried in the Kremlin. Why? Uh, because they were too radical for America. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, he's a fascinating guy, and of course he dies so young that he becomes, well, some of you have seen Reds, right? It's Warren Beatty playing him, and Jack Nicholson play, in this love triangle. Diane Keaton is playing Louise Bryant, at that point, she's having this triangle uh, with O'Neill, played by Jack Nicholson and uh, J Jack Reed, uh, uh, being played by Beatty. It's a damn good movie, too. Uh, and it opens in Provincetown, so you get a feel of mm -hmm. Provincetown, uh, quite a good feel of it. That's a good note to end on, is so that people can yeah. buy the book, see the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.